Today on the Armchair Urbanist, we explore an abandoned railroad viaduct. In this episode of The Armchair Urbanist, we're going to talk about what makes good high-speed rail. Well, when most people think about fast things, say cars, airplanes, or even trains, they usually think about the vehicle that is being used. For cars and airplanes, this is mainly correct. Uh, trains, on the other hand, are a little different. Most normal passenger trains can actually be pretty fast, which is some minor adjustments. A P-42, for example, Amtrak's most used locomotive, can hit a top speed of 110 miles an hour, and it does this in a few places on their system. Rewind the clock a little bit and we remember Amtrak's AEM-7s. These bricks could hit a top speed of 125 miles an hour and they regularly hit that speed on the Northeast Corridor. My point is that when it comes to high-speed rail, it's all about the infrastructure. The rails, the overhead wires are important, but they're honestly the easy part to build. The hardest part about building high-speed rail is having a smooth, level, and straight path with gentle curves. You can see this in modern construction like the California High-Speed Rail Project. Here's a clip from my friend John's channel, The Forefoot. Go check out his channel if you haven't. Here you can see the gentle curves and grade separations being made for the California route. It's pretty impressive, actually. Link for his channel should be in the top right in that icon button thing. The basic ideas for high-speed rail infrastructure have been around for over 100 years. Flat, straight, and smooth track bed construction. This can be found ever since trains started going faster than about 60 miles an hour. One of the best examples of how to construct high-speed rail properly is actually over 100 years old and now abandoned. It's the Lackawanna Cutoff. So what you're looking at here is the Pollen Skill Viaduct. I recorded this episode in the winter when all the leaves on the trees are gone so that you could see this massive bridge better. Not the prettiest time of the year, but it gets the job done. So welcome to a great piece of the Lackawanna Cutoff. Now there are two types of people in the world. There are people that don't really know much about the history and the infrastructure of the Lackawanna Cutoff. And then there is Chuck Walsh. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association and a member of several different advocacy groups in New Jersey. Chuck has a fantastic channel where he discusses the future of the cutoff and all of its history. He has been talking and advocating for the Lackawanna cutoff since the 80s. So if there's anyone to go to for information on this topic, he's your guy. So let's start with why was the cutoff built in the first place? Well, the Lackawanna's main goal was to get people from New York City to Buffalo as fast as possible. Unfortunately, the Lackawanna had some failed merges with the Central Railroad of New Jersey, and that caused a few problems. And now the Lackawanna is stuck with this line that is really not useful to them. I mean, it's useful in the sense that they, they use it, but it's, it's not optimal by any means because it's, it's a circuitous route that has been created because they end up running it's a long story, but they, they buy a different rail line called the Morris and Essex and now have basically uh, a, a much longer route than they, they really want. This old road cut speeds down to 40 miles an hour through its tight corners, and it was basically a detour in the wrong direction. It was obvious that a replacement for the line was needed to cut time and to save the amount of locomotives that was needed for the route. They, they wanted to replace the old road with a new road, and that's, this is, the new road was the cutoff. So planning began on one of the largest mega projects of the early 1900s. The route chosen for the cutoff was to be as straight and as level as possible, allowing for as high as speeds as possible. Back then, speed on the cutoff was mainly limited by how fast steam locomotives could operate reliably, somewhere between 80 to 100 miles an hour. Well, construction officially began on August 1st, 1908, 
but it's built in seven different sections which more or less start construction simultaneously. So by August, late August, September, the whole 28 and a half miles is under construction. The cutoff included some of the largest structures ever seen on a railroad. For example, the Paul and Skill Viaduct was the tallest set concrete structure at the time of its construction. But even that wasn't close to being the largest piece of infrastructure on the cutoff. Technically, the biggest structure is the Pequest Fill, which is a three mile long fill between Andover and Green Township in Sussex County. The Prequest Fill is so large you can easily spot it from space. Nowadays, with it being overgrown with trees, most people would easily think that it's just a large, long natural hill or ridge line. But at the time, this is one of the biggest pieces of railroad infrastructure ever built, all in the name of speed. Now, in terms of speed, there are no official records, but there's, um, I've had communications with folks who were on in the locomotive of trains back in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, where they um, reportedly pinned the, the speedometer, the 100 mile an hour speedometer. So going westbound on the cutoff. So we, we have reason to believe that trains were able to do 100 miles pl uh, plus per, uh, per hour on the cutoff. The, the speed limit varied, the official speed limit varied. It was 80 at, for much of its time, 70, 80, 75, it varied. But um, trains could actually, uh, in, in certain places, go actually a lot faster. And all this speed was down to what makes good high-speed rail today, gentle curves with flat and level track. Uh, that the curves are either two degrees or less. If they had built it differently, they might have built it with even like a, you know, higher speed curves, uh, but that didn't happen. And the thing is with the cutoff, you have to look at the topography of northern New Jersey through which it goes. All your mountains are going like this and the cutoff is going like this. So that's where you get the, the cuts going through the, the hills and then the fills going through the valleys between the, the mountains. So that's, that's why this was such an expensive proposition. At this point, you're probably wondering to yourself, if this is such a great piece of infrastructure, then what the hell happened to it and why is it abandoned now? Well, honestly, the answer to this question is very complex, but there are a few major factors that led to its current state. But the main downfall of the Lackawanna cutoff was the collapse of Penn Central and in turn taking most of the railroads in the Northeast with it. And then, of course, came the Conrail era. Conrail takes over April 1st of 1976 and continues to operate this line until the end of 1978 as a freight line only. Passenger service had ended on this line in 1970, so uh, Amtrak never becomes involved with this line at that when Amtrak is created. But essentially this line be and, and the old Erie line up through New, uh, Port Jervis and such become superfluous to them. They don't, they don't need them. And then this is when all the depressing things start happening. Conrail not only stops using the line, but they go through the effort of removing all of the track on the line. This leaves the cutoff with basically an unusable condition, but it gets worse. Conrail tries to sell off the line to private developers, and that's when Chuck's group steps in to try and save the cutoff. The, the Conrail literally sells off the, the cutoff in well, was the beginning of 1986 to two different developers. And that's where I become involved and basically it comes a fight to try to get the state of New Jersey to buy this right away to preserve it for future use. And hopefully that is the case. NJ Transit does have a plan to restore the line to working order. First part is to restore service to Andover and then eventually to Scranton. More good news is that Amtrak has also added the cut to their 2035 map too, meaning that there is a possibility soon that the cutoff will regain its tracks and have trains running on it again. Not only would it be amazing for commuters and inner city travelers, but as Chuck puts it, it's, I, I see it as a, um, an investment in the future. And yeah, it, it does have a symbolic value because it's, um, you know, aside from its engineering um, accomplishments, there's uh, certainly something that 
I think that where we can see a revitalization of the corridor, where we're not just dependent upon having uh, a car where you can, you can take a train. Chuck just hit the core goals of the Armchair Urbanist series, and what I also believe. Completing this project would not only be a great symbol for fast rail service returning, giving people more mobility options without a car, but also learning from our past to improve and invest in our future. High-speed rail is the future, and we can take a good look back at the Lackawanna cutoff to see a great example of how to build great American infrastructure again. Hey, thanks for watching another Armchair Urbanist video. If you'd like to see the full interview with Chuck Walsh, I'll have it linked below. He's a great guy to talk to and he sure knows what he's talking about. Also, if you'd like to support me so that I can make projects of this scale more often, I do have a Patreon linked below. You're welcome to join our Discord and to follow me on Twitter for train and urban planning rants. But thanks again for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Today on the Armchair Urbanist, we explore an abandoned railroad viaduct.